Per la Laudazio, chiarissima professoressa Francesca Romana Recchia Luciani. Eh, il contributo teorico di Judith Butler ai Gender Studies è attestato non solo dall'innumerevole quantità di ricerche dedicate alla sua produzione filosofica in tutto il mondo, ma anche dal ruolo di riferimento che i suoi testi hanno giocato per l'intera comunità internazionale LGBTQIA+. A Judith Butler si deve l'enorme sviluppo delle teorie queer e il vivace dibattito in corso sull'identità di genere che prosegue e porta avanti i movimenti femministi di liberazione. L'impegno di Butler per la giustizia, l'uguaglianza, la non violenza è meritevole della massima attenzione e del più grande rispetto. La sua elaborazione teorica della categoria di performatività di genere è esposta nei volumi più influenti del XX e del XXI secolo, appunto gli appena nominati il direttore, Gender Trouble, Bodies That Matter, Undoing Gender, se da un lato rappresenta una sfida per le concezioni essenzialiste che fanno discendere il genere solo dal dato biologico e naturalistico, dall'altro dimostra la necessità che gli stereotipi e i ruoli standardizzati in ambito sessuale possano e debbano essere decostruiti in nome della battaglia contro tutte le discriminazioni e per l'autodeterminazione soggettiva e delle minoranze sessuali. Judith Butler ha proposto una lettura filosofica dell'identità di genere e sessuale che ha inciso profondamente sull'evoluzione dei gender studies, dando l'avvio a un profondo ripensamento dello status giuridico dell'identità sessuale, della gestione politica dell'intersessualità e della transessualità, contribuendo sostanzialmente alle lotte per i diritti delle minoranze sessuali. La sua vasta produzione accademica è oggetto di studio in diversi campi di ricerca delle scienze umane e sociali per il livello critico e innovativo e per la cesura che la sua elaborazione teorica ha generato nei campi della filosofia, della teoria queer, degli studi di genere, degli studi postcoloniali e della teoria femminista. Tra i suoi libri fondamentali per lo sviluppo dei gender studies, ricordiamo dopo il suo primo fondante testo, Subject of Desire, A Galian Reflection in 20th Century France, France yes, sorry, The Psychetic Life of Power, Theories of Objection, Excitable Speech, Antigonist Claim, Precarious Life, Powers of Violence, Mourning, Notes toward the performative theory of assembly, the force of nonviolence, e da ultimo, appena tradotto in italiano, what word is this, a pandemic phenomenology. I suoi numerosi libri sono stati tradotti in più di 27 lingue. Ha ricevuto l'Andrew Mell Award for the Shingled Academic Achievement in the Humanities il premio Adorno dalla città di Francoforte per i suoi contributi alla filosofia femminista e morale, il premio Brudner nell'Università di Yale per i risultati ottenuti negli studi su gay e lesbiche, ha ottenuto la Halbert Magnus Professorship della città di Colonia, ha ottenuto le Wellec Lectures a Irvine, le Carpenter Lectures all'Università di Chicago, le Watts Lecture al Museo Nobel di Stoccolma, le Gauss Lecture a Princeton, le Messenger Lectures a Cornell, le Tanner Lectures all'Università di Yale e le Freud Lecture annuale al Museo Freud di Vienna. Ha ricevuto 14 lauree honoris causa. Nel 2014 ha ricevuto il titolo di Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters dal Ministro della Cultura Francese successivamente riconfermato come comandante. Ha inoltre fatto parte del comitato consultivo dell'Istituto per, gli, per la Scuola di Francoforte, eh, per gli studi sociali della Scuola di Francoforte. Nel 2015 ha ricevuto il titolo di Honorary Geographer dell'American Association of Geographers e la nomina di Corresponding Fellow della British Academy. Nel 2022 ha ricevuto il premio internazionale della Catalogna dal cantone di Catalogna e la medaglia d'oro dal Circulo des Belas Artes di Madrid. Judith Butler è Distinguished Professor presso la Graduate School dell'Università di Berkeley. Ha fondato e diretto insieme a Martin Jay il Critical Theory Program presso la UC Berkeley. 
con una sovvenzione della Fondazione Mellon ha fondato e sviluppato l'International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs dal 2016 al 2020, del quale è attualmente co-presidente del Consiglio di Amministrazione e membro del comitato editoriale della rivista Critical Times. Ha fatto parte del Consiglio Esecutivo della Modern Languages Association e ha presieduto il Comitato per la Libertà Accademica e le Responsabilità Professionali, prima di ricoprire la carica di Presidente dell'organizzazione dal 2020. È docente nel Psychosocial MA Program del Birkbeck College, University of London, e insegna presso la Hannah Arendt Chair alla European Graduate School in Svizzera. Sarà è attualmente l'intellettuale di residenza del Saint Pompidou di Parigi per tutto il corso del 2024. Butler ha svolto il ruolo di attivista in diverse organizzazioni per i diritti umani, tra cui il Center for Constitutional Rights di New York e il Comitato Consultivo di Jewish Voice for Peace. Thank you, Judith Butler. Procediamo con la proclamazione della laureata. Procediamo con Alexio Magistralis, Judith Butler, Imagining Beyond Fear and Distraction. Very short. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. No okay, perfect. Uh, see, yes. Buongiorno. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I am very honored uh, to be here today and to receive this honorary degree from the University of Bari. And I'm especially honored to have been chosen by the Department of Gender Studies here with its obvious and impressive record of academic excellence and its commitment to open inquiry. I must say that if you honor me or my contribution to gender studies, then you honor all the scholars whose work inspired my own and all the students and faculty who currently work in the field. I say this because today it is perhaps less important to honor me as an individual than it is to affirm the value of feminist thought, feminist studies, gay and lesbian studies, and the important new work in trans studies. Um, I am not post-feminist. I'm still a very strong feminist. <laughs> um, those of you who work in this field know that we work at the intersection of social science and the humanities, social and labor history and science, psychoanalysis and political theory, We draw on geography and the visual arts to understand the deep-seated power dynamics, the structures of inequality, and the promises, the potentials for a world more free, more just, and more equal. 
Italian feminism is honored the world over for its courage and its radicalism. And by radical, I mean the effort to uncover the roots of oppression, to expose the structures that have been reproduced over time to produce inequality, and to struggle for a world where equality and freedom can be affirmed. I come from another history of thought, but I have found amazing interlocutors here, including the great Adriana Cabrero. During these times, we have experienced what some call a backlash against feminism, against the ideals of racial justice, the ideals of sanctuary, and the rights of migrants, um, the, the rights of, of migrants under international law. We are seeing right now the brutal violence in the Middle East, where state violence now threatens to kill more and more people every day, where the prospect of armed struggle threatens to defeat the ideals of a just and nonviolent movement for Palestinian freedom. These are times when it may feel that history is moving backwards. Patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia stoke the passions of hatred and fear. Fascism emerges from within democratic institutions, not only from the outside and our climate disaster continues. But it is times like these, when matters are most urgent, that it is crucial to keep our educational institutions open. We need to take together the time to think, to learn, and to resist the forces that embrace censorship, nationalism, xenophobia, and the abandonment of migrants at sea. We cannot struggle for justice without knowing the history of justice and injustice. I'm glad somebody has freedom of expression back there. That's good, that's good. You're free to be here. And we cannot act in principle if we have not read the theories and the writings of those who have thought most passionately about love and justice. These are times when our gatherings exemplify the world we want to bring about the ideals of equality and cohabitation that traverse and transcend every national boundary. We must wonder why those most interested in reviving nationalism and restoring patriarchy are so angry about something they call gender. Genera. Do they study gender studies? Do they know the array of different methodologies and approaches that we find in gender studies? Or do they make of gender a phantasm, phantasma? And do they invest this phantasma with the power to destroy civilization, the family, and even man himself? We see what lives they seek to destroy with their phantasma, women who have struggled for reproductive freedom, freedom from violence, and, and um, economic equality, gay, lesbian, and trans people who wish simply to live free of fear and discrimination with full public recognition of their lives and their loves. So if you honor me, then you honor all those who made my life and work possible, and the communities of scholars and activists without whom my work could not be. I am but one of many people more worthy than I am who deserve re recognition and honor today. Thank you all for this great honor, which I pass on to all those who deserve our enduring respect and admiration. Grazie.
famosa non giacchi non le regole. Non giacchi, no? No, la vuoi fare in piedi o la faccio in piedi? Si è tolto la giacca che si muore. Eh no, io invece sto fermo. Eh lo so, hai ragione. Si è tolto la giacca. Si è tolto la giacca. That works perfectly. Grazie. Okay. Um, grazie. Um, I have said that I would talk about fear and destruction and that I would suggest a way beyond it. Let us start then with one set of fears, what we might call the fear of gender. What is this gender that is so feared? And what is this fear that attaches itself to gender? When public debates engage the topic of gender, do they stop to ask what is meant by gender? Or is it a term that has become a focus of fears and anxieties that may or may not have to do with gender as we understand it? It was curious and disturbing to me to find that gender was something presented as a destructive power in various political discourses. And since I never thought of gender as possessing such a power, I had to reflect on what is actually being feared. My hypothesis is that the term gender has attracted an array of anxieties and fears that emerge from a variety of sources, including economic and ecological conditions. To see it this way is to say, in effect, that it is not gender that is truly frightening, but some other sense of what is happening to our world, that gender is but a substitute for the, this other host of fears. It would be easier if I could simply defend that analysis, but there is another problem. To the extent that gender implies a way of thinking about our embodied lives, our sense of who we are, our sense of how the world is structured, it touches upon intimate zones of life and so upon intimate fears as well. Although the anti-gender movement does not study gender, it does hold many opinions about what it is. And one set of beliefs can be found in its many international forms. The first and most alarming of its claims is that gender harms children, that it is an ideology 
that indoctrinates children and that it is imposed in the classroom, or worse, it is a way of seducing students who do not know better. The second is that gender defies both a natural and a divine order, erasing the specific character of masculine and feminine values and contesting creationism. This second point assumes that a natural order corresponds with contemporary science, though that idea of nature is now several centuries old. The third is that gender is dangerous to the nation, that it represents either a threat to a national spiritual or cultural identity, or even to national security. It is therefore necessary for those who study gender or who find gender to be a useful category in, for instance, educational contexts, in policy, in history, and law, to expose and defeat these viewpoints as wrong. And I hope to do that as well. But there is a larger question, one that we perhaps miss if we move too quickly to simply defeat our opponents by offering better arguments. Of course, we must offer better arguments, but how do we account for the fear that courses through the debate on gender so that its opponents very often find it hard for people to consider arguments at all? Remember, most people who oppose gender have not studied any key texts in gender or feminist studies, which means that they are not engaging standards of evidence that we expect of our students, of academic work, or even of professional journalism. If those writings are considered the work of the devil, then to read those works is to traffic with the devil, if those writings have the power to, to indoctrinate, then one is obligated not to read those writings and not even to learn how to read them in order not to be affected or infected by a so-called dangerous ideology. Unfortunately, the attacks on gender are often committed both to anti-intellectualism and in opposition to the ideals of the university. The university is a place for open inquiry. That is part of its definition and its promise. Open inquiry is not the same as accepting all viewpoints as equally good. No, we are asked to base our arguments on evidence and even to know the different kinds of evidence that, there, that are to be found throughout the disciplines. A literary critic will in general look to the text at hand and its context to arrive at a good interpretation. A biologist will have to find the method and framework that is best suited to the investigation at hand. In the academy, we are not, not only asked to find evidence for our claims, but to make judgments about what constitutes evidence. And if we work in archives that are incomplete, we have to know how to interpret the gap the omissions. If we find complex relationships among the facts that we are studying, we have to devise concepts and frameworks that can best explain what we see. At the same time, the framework we use does affect how we see things. So taking up a new model can actually illuminate an object or a field more powerfully than the models that came before. Open inquiry means remaining open to new kinds of frameworks, including new modes of interpretation and theories that illuminate our world differently, that let us consider forms of complexity that earlier models could not consider. We can, of course, agree to go back to older models to refuse the complexity that we now see, but it does not make good sense to do so since we have already seen the complexity and it is difficult to unknow what one already knows. I am suggesting that gender studies asks us to rethink the way we know our world, that it is a mode of inquiry that asks us to consider how the relations of power and possibility by which the world is structured, how they come into being. 
if we need to take into account the relation of power that takes place between men and women in the public sphere or in the household, then we need a name for the power relation we are studying. But also for the very inquiry into the settled arrangements, the modes of inequality and hierarchy that have come to define what we mean by public or by political or virtue or health, many concepts that have been conventionally associated with masculinity. If we ask whether another way of ordering society is possible, we are asking about gender. And if gender is a way of understanding a dimension of power that orders society, a set of relations that order society, then it is not first and foremost an identity. On the contrary, it is a way of asking not only how are relations between men and women organized in society, but how do the very notions of men and women become settled categories with presumed meanings? If we ask, for instance, whether a woman can undertake a certain form of work that has conventionally belonged to men, we're not only asking whether or not she has a certain capacity, we are also asking about the very definition of women. In other words, the definition of women has to change to accommodate the recognition that she does indeed have that capacity or that some women do. If we find ourselves in an anxious moment, asking whether it would be too masculine to do a certain activity or appear a certain way in public, then we become aware that under certain circumstances, we can lose that sense of being masculine or feminine, or that we can appear to have lost it, which means that those very terms, masculine and feminine, can be challenged. Many people order their lives or live according to an established order to make sure that that sense of anxiety can be quelled. But that anxiety tells us something important. It is a common anxiety. Oh, I cannot go out that way. I cannot be seen that way. I cannot learn that kind of skill or show that kind of vulnerability. All of these quite personal concerns and anxieties attest to the fact that the social order that is supposed to be natural and necessary permits of challenges and deviations, and that the social order itself can change. For luckily, both men and women may find themselves less concerned with solidifying gender according to certain norms than they used to. And for most of them, it does not mean that they have ceased to be women or ceased to be men, but only that they've been part of an historical change. Gender changes through time. And by gender, I do not mean only masculine or feminine, but the entire arrangement. The idea, for instance, that there can only be masculine and feminine, or no other gendered life beyond that binary belongs to a certain arrangement of gender a distinct set of historical formations that are thus impermanent and changeable. Gender is not just gender identity. It is also an historically changing arrangement of a set of embodied social categories subject to normative power. I have spoken about this fear of losing one's gender. How is it possible to fear losing one's gender? Um, it's an odd sort of fear, but we know people who say that they would rather die than appear in public in a certain way, or they would rather die than engage in a gay or lesbian relationship. Some ways of appearing, some ways of living or loving are considered unthinkable, unlivable. Indeed, they become specters that live at the limits of thought and life. But for those who live with this kind of fear, they constitute the limits of the thinkable and the livable. These are everyday fears, and they often structure the conventions that govern everyday life. On the one hand, masculine and feminine are considered fixed poles of experience. On the other hand, their unfixity, their instability, has to be managed all the time. 
The anti-gender movement or the movement against gender ideology is full of fear and accords something called gender the power to efface and appropriate sex. Well, that's a powerful claim, and you know it well from the Italian context and the declarations of Prime Minister Meloni. For if you are told that something called gender will take your sex away, your sexed identity away, that it will strip you of the sex that you are, then you might think, think gender is a monstrous and threatening force and that it should be opposed for sure. But if you are told that you're living in a specific historical arrangement of masculine and feminine, then you may become aware that this arrangement can change, but you would have no reason to fear that someone will come and take away your sexed identity. Of course, if you believe that your sexed identity is not only yours, but is universal, then you might be unsettled by learning that the norms and conventions governing masculinity and femininity can change, and that they can change in the direction of creating greater equality and even less violence. If that historical change is bothersome to you, then you might find yourself clinging to the norms that suit you, but you have lost nothing except a sense that your sense of your sex is shared across all history and all places. In other words, you have lost only that sense that who you are is universally true for everyone. So if newer gender arrangements are more equal, then it may be equality that you oppose, a sense of your proper place within a hierarchy. And if the newer arrangements permit, not only for greater equality, but for greater freedom and the eradication of gender violence, then you may want to oppose them. But if you do, you are opposing much more than gender. In fact, you are opposing history and its emancipatory potentials in order to defend a stable order that has too long reproduced power and violence. I start with examples such as these in order to arrive at a sense of the visceral fears that gender and sexuality can raise. But what I want to add now is that gender stands for a great number of social and economic anxieties that are not about gender. Those fears are congealed and displaced in the discourse on gender, but they are heightened, of course, by the anxieties that gender orders produce. When gender becomes a sign of danger, it can become the sign of many adjacent dangers. For instance, gender has become a focal point for political mobilization on the right, associated with um, possible harm done to children in its name. It has been called a demonic ideology. What should be a debate, but which is not a debate, is heightened by a number of fears, among which is the fear that something called gender steals identities, or that it is fakery, or that it is a form of colonization, or that it invades like unwanted migrants do, or that it represents the rise of totalitarian powers, or that it marks the extreme of hyper-capitalism. A wildly contradictory set of claims are made about what gender is and what dangers it poses. In every case, however, gender is figured as a destructive power that must be stopped. How did gender become so easily and effectively deployed to give focus and form to fears of destruction and to mobilize attacks on vulnerable communities, intensifying their exposure to violence and dispensability. As you know, we live in times in which we see the earth destroyed by powers that seek to maximize their profits and extend state control. We also see the attack on women, gay and lesbian people, trans people and migrants, attacks which are focused on sexuality, gender and race, all operating in various parts of the world to support authoritarian structures, if not neo-fascist passions and politics. And yet, in our analyses of such matters, we rarely feature such attacks as constitutive elements of a new fascism. 
Here I want to make three claims that are essential to the remarks that I have to offer you today. The first is that fascist passions are intensified and accelerated by attacks on women, LGBTQIA plus people and migrants, black and brown people and the poor. Secondly, these attacks appeal to the fear of destruction with which many people live, not only workers who fear the loss of their jobs and the stability of their lives, but people forced into migration by the ongoing climate disaster. And thirdly, these attacks, whether they take the form of physical attacks, murder, or legal disenfranchisement, also redirect the fear of destruction with which people live. If gender or migration are identified by the right as the cause of destruction, then they become the targets of destruction. If a nation can get rid of them or hold them in states of indefinite subordination or detention, then, the appar then apparently the fear of destruction can come to an end. That is the false promise. Or at least that is one of the false promises of fascism. And as you know, in the history of Italy, uh, fascism has always been full of false promises. Or perhaps it's not a promise at all, but rather a fantasy, collective in nature and lethal in its effects. Gender is one of the vectors through which fascist passions are stoked and circulated. The kinds of passions that support increasingly authoritarian regimes that justify their wars and their acts of destruction by appearing as if they are putting an end to what threatens society with destruction. If gender has become a phantasm, we have to think about how this phantasma is constructed and articulated and what we need to do in order to deflate and defeat the destructive power it wields. For this, we need to create firmer bonds of solidarity as we create a vision that is finally more powerful and desirable than the one we oppose, an imaginary in which the right to live, to breathe, to live together, to live as a body in the world without fear of violence remains a fundamental and collective freedom a persistent, if not inexhaustible, demand. My wager is that the best way to make the case for freedom is to embody that freedom collectively in ways that make freedom into the condition and object of political desire. This means rejecting ideas of personal liberty based on property and self-interest alone in favor of new collectivities in which my freedom is not really possible without the freedom of others. This is a difficult process, considering all the disagreements on the left and within feminism, but it remains necessary if we are to come to desire freedom and embodied life, not only for our individual selves, but for the expanding circle of living beings to whom we are still connected. Without those connections, none of us can live or live well. None of us can even exist. I say this during a time in which the notion of interdependency, not only among humans, but among all living creatures, provides a critical perspective against a climate catastrophe produced by anthropocentric arrogance. Cohabitation within a social world is necessarily linked with the regenerative potentials of the earth, and there is now, um, and never has been, uh, sorry, there is no way clearly to distinguish between the future of human life and living processes themselves. The two are indissolubly linked. As you know, the anti-gender ideology movement has its origins in Catholic doctrines formulated in the 1990s, the Beijing Conference in 1995. It quickly spread through Latin American Catholic and evangelical churches in the subsequent years. And in its current form, it can be found throughout Eastern Europe, epitomized perhaps by Putin and Orban 
in Italy espoused by Meloni, but also in South Korea and Taiwan, in Pentecostal churches in North Africa, and in the US Republican Party and its evangelical base. It is well organized by digital platforms such as Citizen Go. The anti-gender ideology movement treats gender as a monolith, frightening in its power and reach. How are we to think about this fear? Is it discovered and exploited, or is it manufactured for another purpose? In Russia, gender has been called a threat to national security, and the Vatican has said it is a threat to both civilization and to man. In conservative evangelical and Catholic communities throughout the world, gender is taken as code for a political agenda that seeks not only to destroy the traditional family, but to prohibit any reference to mother and father in favor of a genderless future. I know no one who has proposed eliminating the term mother or father. I know no one. I, I travel the world. I know some things about gender studies. There is no one I know who has made that proposal. OK, I'm just saying. I would add that if there are two mothers, that does not destroy the word mother. It actually reproduces it. It makes it multiple. That is not destruction. That is a new historical arrangement. OK. Um, in recent US campaigns to keep gender out of the classroom, it's treated as a code for pedophilia or for a seductive or indoctrinating pedagogy that teaches young people how to masturbate or teaches them how to become gay. These are preposterous accusations. The same argument was made in Bolsonaro's Brazil, hope he finds a new job somewhere else, <laughs> on the grounds that gender calls into question the natural and normative character of heterosexuality, and that once the mandate to become heterosexual is lifted, a flood of sexual perversities, including bestiality and pedophilia, will be unleashed upon the earth. This argument conveniently forgets the long-standing and hideous history of the sexual abuse of children by priests, subsequently exonerated and protected for their abuse, reports of which continue to accumulate daily. In fact, the projection of child abuse onto those who teach sex education or provide trans health care for young people may well be but one example of how the phantasm of gender works. As a phantasm with destructive power, powers, attributed um, powers, gender is a term, an image, an idea, a phantasmatic form formation that circulates and intensifies, collects and escalates, multiple fears of destruction circulating in our time. And of course, there are many reasons to fear destruction. As I've said, there is climate destruction, forced migration, lives imperiled and lost in war as we speak in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Israel. These are, there are neoliberal economies that are depriving people of basic social services they need to live and thrive. There is systemic racism that takes the lives of many through slow and quick forms of violence. And women, queer, and trans people, especially those who are black and brown, are murdered in many parts of the world at appalling rates. On the right, however, the list is different. Challenges to patriarchal power and social structures in the state civil society and kinship, migration that challenges traditional ideas of the nation, that challenge white supremacy and Christian nationalism alike. The list goes on, but no list can explain how fears of destruction are exploited by various movements, institutions, and states, and how gender or the teaching about systemic racism or colonial histories are blamed for the acute sense of feeling imperiled that many people now feel. For gender to be identified as a threat to life, civilization, society, the nation, man, it has to gather up a wide range of fears and anxieties. It has to package them into a single bundle, subsume them under a single name. And as Freud taught us about dreams, 
Whatever is happening in phantasms such as these involves the condensation of a number of elements and the displacement from what, does, what, from what one does not want to see or name. Thus circulating the phantasm of gender is one way for existing powers, states, churches, political movements, to frighten people, to come back into their ranks, to accept censorship, and to externalize and project their fear and hatred onto already vulnerable communities. But they also appeal, appeal, appeal to basic fears and anxieties that are raised by sexual life, social categories that name different forms of embodiment, and the recognition that sexuality and gender take different forms, that diversity is to be affirmed as long as no harm is done. The idea that teaching gender harms children does not consider the harm that queer and trans youth suffer when their parents and schools condemn or stigmatize them, or when they suffer pathologization or violence in every walk of life. The violence that happens inside traditional families is not remarked upon or addressed, but all the violence, all the domestic violence is transported outside, attributed to educators of gender whose apparent violence is to suggest that family forms do, in fact, change, and that they can manifest principles of equality and nonviolence that we have not seen before. So as much as we must argue against all these ill-founded and unjust attacks on gender, we must also understand what these attacks are doing, what social movements are being attacked in the name of anti-gender, and what ideals of democracy are undermined by these attacks. I would include freedom, equality, and nonviolent cohabitation. These attacks not only appeal to existing fears that many working people have about the future of work or the sanctity of their own family life, but they incite that fear, insisting that people identify gender as the true cause of their feelings of anxiety and trepidation about the world. Consider the incitation of Pope Francis in 2015. After warning of the existence of Herods in every historical period, Gender theory is said to consist of contemporary Herodians who, and I quote, plot designs of death that disfigure the face of man and woman, destroying creation, end quote. He then makes clear just how annihilating the force of gender theory is, and I quote, let's think of nuclear arms, of the possibility to annihilate in a few instances a very high number of human beings. Let's also think of genetic manipulation, of the manipulation of life, or of the gender theory that does not recognize the order of creation. Now, Pope Francis, who is, I know, a better pope than many, continues with a story about how funding for education for schools serving the poor was provisioned on the condition that gender theory be included in the curriculum. We're not given any details about what precisely is meant by gender theory there, but it clearly is supposed to be feared, as one would fear the massive loss of life as, as one would from a bomb. To require the teaching of gender in schools is, in his words, ideological colonization. He adds that the same was done by the dictators of the last century. Think of Hitler youth. Oof. The Vatican's inflammatory rhetoric is itself quite destructive, given the influence of the institution and the generally high esteem in which Pope Francis has been held. If gender is the equivalent of a nuclear bomb, it has to be dismantled. If it is the devil itself, all those who represent gender must be expelled from humanity. And my enemies in Brazil let me know that I was to be expelled from humanity. Whether figured as a nuclear bomb, the devil, a new version of totalitarianism, pedophilia, or colonization, gender has assumed, assumed a startling number of phantasmatic forms, eclipsing both academic and ordinary usage. As a consequence, circulating the idea of gender's destructive powers is one way to produce existential fear that can be exploited by those who want greater state powers to fulfill the promise of a return to patriarchal order that will ostensibly reestablish a secure order. 
The fear is stoked so that authorities who promise its alleviation can enter as forces of redemption and restoration. The fear is produced and exploited in order to rally people to support those who would destroy not just the concept of gender or the field of study, but all the social movements and public policies organized through such terms, including an opposition to gender-based violence. Now, you know, of course, that your Prime Minister Meloni has told the Italian and Spanish publics in her famous Marbella speech that the advocates of gender will strip you of your sexed identity. In fact, you shouldn't even be in this room because by the time you leave, you will not have a sexed identity. I will have taken it, I will have taken it, and you will be in terrible trouble. Um, one of the presuppositions of her argument is that sexed identity is fundamental and valuable and that it would be wrong if anyone tried to take it away. I, I want to agree with her. Let's just agree with her. It is true. Um, Sexed identity is fundamental and valuable, and no one has the right to take it away. So I agree with this proposition. But if we say that, as a matter of fact, people generally regard what is called sexed identity as valuable, and that it should not be expropriated by others, then it follows that legislation that seeks either to prevent or pathologize or criminalize trans sexed identity does precisely that. It strips people of the sexed identity they have sought to establish through law or through public recognition. So this argument performs an inversion. She exploits or manufactures the fear that sexed identity will be taken away precisely to deny rights that would guard against that very stripping of identity. In other words, she exploits that fear for the purposes of stripping trans people of their rights of self-determination. And she mobilizes the fear of having one's sexed identity nullified in order to nullify the sexed identities of others, thus instilling fear in those who face that nullification. The very fear of being deprived of something so intimate and defining as a sexed identity depends on a general understanding that this indeed would be a deprivation Yet the consequences of this very view are not generalized. They are not universalized. If they were, it would follow that it would be simply wrong to deprive someone of the sexed aspect of their very being. And from this premise, it would be possible to universalize the claim and to refuse to engage in any activity that would deprive anyone of their sexed identity, including trans people. But the opposite has proven to be true when the right to my own sex requires that you lose yours. Although some very different ideas of sexed identity are at play in debates such as these, they share the assumption that whatever sexed identity may be, it can be taken away and it should not be. Okay, so you see, I agree with her premise, I disagree with her conclusion. So you may know in January of this year, the Italian government ordered state agencies to stop registering children born to gay and lesbian couples. I would have lost my son had I been living here earlier in, in, in life. And in northern Italy, a, straight, a state prosecutor has ordered the cancellation of and reissuance of at least 33 birth certificates for the children of lesbian couples. Indeed, non-gestational mothers have received notice that their status as mothers would be removed. These are appalling acts done in the name of restoring the natural or normal family, according to Meloni, that is, a family with a man and woman joined by marriage. The consequences for all these parents is enormous. I know, I had to secure my legal status in California as the parent of my son. Without that status, I could not make decisions for him at the hospital, with the doctor, at the border, or at the school. These are the legitimate concerns of the parents in Milan who took to the streets with Elie Schlein in March of this year to oppose being stripped of their fundamental rights. The arguments against surrogacy are also clearly instrumentalized against gay men, and objecting to foreign sur surrogates is another way of saying that the natural family is the national family. 
It is a way of defining the nation through heterosexual conjugality and reproduction mixed with the same xenophobia that has bolstered the attacks on migrants in the Mediterranean and their inhumane treatment at the border. To understand the phantasmatic force of gender, we have to consider it as a psychosocial phenomenon, as a site where intimate fears and anxieties become socially organized to incite political passions. These passions do, do not take the form of debate, as I mentioned above. There's no text in the room that is not eligible for censorship, no agreement on terms, and fear and hatred has flooded the landscape where critical thought and open inquiry should be. We are rather all living in a phantasmatic scene. And in referring to a phantasmatic scene, I adapt the theoretical formulation of Jean Laplanche for thinking about psychosocial phenomena. For Laplanche, fantasy is not simply the product of the imagination, a wholly subjective reality. In its most fundamental form, it has to be understood as a syntactical arrangement of elements of psychic life. Thus, fantasy is not just a content of the mind, a subliminal reverie, but an organization of desire and anxiety that follows certain structural and organizational rules. Much could be said psychoanalytically between conscious and unconscious fantasy, but here I want only to suggest that the organization or syntax of dreams and fantasy is at once social and psychic. Although Laplanche was interested in infancy and the formation of an original fantasy, I'm asking whether we can appropriate some aspects of his view to understand anti-gender as a phantasmatic scene. My wager is that we will be better able to respond to this movement and its discourse by framing the matter this way. For when the scene is set and something called gender is imagined to be acting on children, academics or the public in nefarious and destructive way, gender has substituted for a number of destructive forces appealing to a complex set of anxieties and has thus become an overdetermined site where the fear of destruction gathers and accelerates. Such fears are bundled into an inflammatory syntax in which some foreign element wields enormous power to destroy social structures as many have known them, the family, the nation, civilization, man itself. Considered as a public phantasm, gender bundles all these issues together, treats them as a coordinated and concerted movement and ideology, and then attacks them as a monolith. This bundling operation is what marks the object of their opposition as a phantasm. In fact, the term gender oscillates between the ordinary and the catastrophic, depending on where one lives, how recently the term has come into use, and whether it has been construed as a dangerous phantasm by those who seek to preserve patriarchal forms of family and state. One increasingly publicized fear is that certain academic fields of study have become modes of left-wing indoctrination, Sometimes gender studies is characterized as a dangerous ideology inflicted on apparently susceptible and vulnerable students from grade school to college. The youth need to be protected from gender. And in a frenzy of recent Republican legislative efforts in the US, teaching about gender is variously said to be a form of ideological inculcation, seduction, and pedophilia. It is also seen in the US and beyond as a plot by urban elites to impose their cultural values on real people, a form of colonization by superpowers or an invasion of migrants from poor or war-inflicted countries, or a set of ideas that are in opposition to both science and religion. We could go on. Apparently, the only way to counter this destructive force is to restore patriarchy. For only patriarchal order, the fantasy goes, puts a stop to destruction and disorientation. In patriarchy, a father is a father, sexed identity never changes, women conceived as born female at birth resume their natural and moral positions within the household, and white people hold uncontested racial supremacy. The restoration project, however, is fragile, since the patriarchal order it seeks to restore never quite existed in the form that they seek to actualize in the present. 
The past they seek to restore is already a dream, a wish, a fantasy of a patriarchal ideal that will reinstate order grounded in patriarchal authority. The recruitment of communities into the anti-gender ideology movement is a solicitation to join a collective dream, perhaps to enter a psychosis that will put an end to the implacable anxiety and fear that afflict so many people experiencing climate destruction firsthand or ubiquitous violence and brutal war, expanding police powers or intensifying economic precarity. The dream cannot be realized without appropriating and intensifying the destructive powers that it ostensibly seeks to check. Finally then, stoking the fantasy of restoring patriarchal power works as a mobilization technique only if the people to whom the appeal is made have ready wishes and desires to exploit. The mobilization of anti-gender sentiment by the right depends on the credibility of this dream of the past. No one is providing historical documentation about this patriarchal order that needs to be restored to its rightful place. It is not a past that has existed in historical time, even if we can find many instances of patriarchal organization throughout history, as many have already done. This is a past, rather, that belongs to the dream whose syntax reorders elements of reality in the service of a driving force that does not always make itself easily known. The dream works in waking life only as a phantasmatic organization of reality, one that offers a range of examples and accusations to shore up the political case it wants to make. In fact, it hardly matters that historical documentation is not supplied. It surely does not matter that the argument on, offered, on offer is riddled with contradiction. The incoherence and impossibility of the case against gender represents contradictory phenomena and even offers its public a way to collect many of its fears and convictions without ever having to make that bundle coherent, right? Gender can represent hyper-capitalism, but it can be also nothing other than Marxism. Well, which one is it? Gender represents capitalism. Gender is nothing but Marxism. Gender is a libertarian construct, tells you you can do whatever you want. Gender signals the new wave of totalitarianism and is therefore the end to freedom. Gender will corrupt the nation like unwanted migrants, but also like imperialist powers from the north. Which one is it? Is it an imperialist power coming from the north? Is it a migrant coming from the south? Maybe it's both. Maybe the phantasm allows you to hold all those elements without ever having to reconcile them in any kind of logical manner. The contradictory character of the phantasm allows it to contain whatever anxiety or fear that the anti-gender ideology movement wishes to stoke for its own purposes without having to make any of it cohere. Indeed, the liberation from historical documentation and coherent logic is part of the escalating exhilaration that feeds a fascist frenzy and rallies around forms of authoritarianism. The anti-gender mm, uh, agenda is buoyed by the excitement of depriving lives of what they require to live, including fundamental and intimate freedoms and access to legal, medical, and educational resources that make life livable. We have to remember that this is a form of excitement. By criminalizing and pathologizing sexual and gender minorities, refusing to recognize the historically shifting character of our embodied and sexual lives, censoring books and policing curricula, the anti-gender ideology movement supports forms of institutional sadism in the name of divine or human morality, warding off the devil, incest, pedophilia, protecting the nation's patriarchal order from state to family and civilization. Remarkable and disturbing is the way that this moral campaign relishes experimenting with various ways of denying the very existence of others, stripping them of rights, denying their reality, restricting basic freedoms, engaging in shameless forms of racial hatred, controlling, demeaning, caricaturing, pathologizing, and criminalizing those lives. I'm going to skip some pages, sorry about the complication. I see, much longer than I expected. 
um, I'm moving uh, all the way uh, to um, page uh, 28 of the English. Um, the paragraph begins, the contemporary fascist trends. Maybe it's possible to find. The contemporary fascist trends, ones that engage in death dealing and rights stripping in the name of defending the family, the state, and other patriarchal institutions, support ever strengthening forms of authoritarianism. That is why it makes no sense for gender critical feminists to ally with reactionary powers in targeting trans, non-binary, and gender queer people. Despite our differences, we have to stay in the struggle, testing our theories about the other by listening and reading, being open to having one's traditional suppositions challenged, and finding ways to build alliances that allow our antagonisms not to replicate the destructive cycles we oppose. We cannot oppose discrimination against ourselves only to support discrimination against others. We cannot oppose systemic forms of hatred against one group by allying with those who would intensify that hatred in multiple directions or by making hatred into political currency. It is no time for any of the targets of this movement to be petty and divisive, for to defend gender studies and the importance of gender to any concept of justice, freedom, and equality is to ally with the fight against censorship and against fascism. We can argue about key concepts like sex, gender, and sexuality, and we surely should. Every gender studies classroom is full of arguments about all those terms, and we should keep those arguments going. There's no one theory, right? There's no one approach. There are different theories, different methodologies. That's what the university is for, have the open debate. No trans person is taking the sex away from anyone who considers themselves to be a woman. That is the fantasy of expropriation that allies with the fascist phantasmatic. History advises us not to deny the fascist potentials that are increasingly actualized in several regions of the world, even if they have not yet emerged as the kind of fascist states we have known and you have known. If readiness to resist fascism is now imperative, then we have to identify the forms it now takes and intensify the resistance to its momentum. Releasing radical democratic potentials from our own expanding alliances can show we are on the side of life, livable life, love, and freedom. Making those ideals so compelling that no one can look away, making desire desirable again in such a way that people want to live and want others to live in the world we envision. What if we make freedom into the air we together breathe? For that is the air that belongs to us all, sustaining our lives, unless, of course, the toxins pervade the atmosphere. Thank you very much. Non è che poi ci lasciate soli quando dobbiamo difendere l'università pubblica però, eh? cioè ricordatevelo che questo è stato possibile perché questa è un'università pubblica e quindi...
Sì, allora adesso Romana, dopo che ringraziamo Judith Butler ancora una volta, Romana farà un annuncio per continuare. Io mi vado a togliere questa pelliccia perché sta a 200 gradi Fahrenheit sotto di me, ho sofferto in silenzio, ma vi ricordo che l'università ha bisogno di tutti voi. Grazie. Bene. Eh, grazie, grazie, grazie a, a Judith Butler per questa occasione veramente straordinaria. Io ringrazio tutte e tutti voi, tutte le persone che sono venute a sentire questa lezione straordinaria, questa magnifica introduzione al dottorato in studi di genere. Eh, inizia con questa lezione il convegno della rete Nosotros, ma ci sarà una pausa di 20 minuti, ricominciamo alle, alle 16 perché abbiamo bisogno un attimo di allergerirci e quindi le persone che eventualmente non sono interessate a seguire il convegno possono tranquillamente allontanarsi mentre ci vediamo alle 16 per riprendere i lavori del convegno che inaugureremo fra qualche minuto. Grazie.